Dear objects of God's mercy, my friends. The words of God that we're going to meditate on, as I mentioned, are the words that I read to you from Isaiah chapter 43. However, I'm going to add a verse to that lesson today. That was the chosen pericope for this Sunday, but I'm going to include another verse in our meditation today, and that's this verse which follows immediately after. It says, But you burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. This is the word of our God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you knowing our sins, O Lord. We know that we deserve nothing from you, but we thank you that your revelation today by your Holy Spirit to this word gives us hope. And we pray that as we meditate on these words, you would continue to give us hope in your mercy. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, AT&T wants you to believe that they are the best wireless company. And they have all kinds of commercials on right now that let you know that they are the best. And if you've seen any of the March Madness games recently, you've probably seen the one where the the announcer, Phil, does color commentary by commenting on the colors of the players that are out there. Or maybe your favorite is the one where the guy is getting his brakes changed and the, the guy that's changing his brakes says, we have a saying around here, if our brakes don't stop it, something will. Or maybe your favorite is the one where the guy's getting a tattoo and the guy that is getting the tattoo is a little concerned and he questions him and the, and the guy with, that's giving the tattoo says, stay in your lane, bro. They're kind of ridiculous commercials. The point of the commercial is just okay is not okay. And so when you see these people doing these kind of half-hearted things, the idea is AT&T does better. They do best. And their slogan that you hear all the time is, we do, you do, or, I'm sorry, um, more of your thing so that, that we do our thing. Is why we do our thing. I'm sorry, got it mixed up a little bit there. More of your thing, that's why we do our thing. And forgive me, but when I read our text for today, those words are what stuck in my mind. Only I'm going to change them just a little bit today. More for our thing, that's why God does his thing. See, God does a new thing, we're told in our text today. And that new thing that he does is what we respond to and we do our thing because of God's new thing that he's done for us. And that new thing that God does for us is not dependent at all on the old thing that we tend to do. Got it? Let's sort this out a little bit. Let's start with the new thing that God does. See, Isaiah begins with a thing that God had done for God's people. And that thing was a great thing that God had done for them. It was when they were slaves in Egypt and had been slaves for a long time. And God did a great thing for them. He redeemed them. He saved them out of that captivity that they were in. And the pinnacle thing that God did in that is what Isaiah mentions as the Lord speaks here. He talks about God who delivered them from Egypt by drying up the Red Sea so that they could pass through that Red Sea on dry ground. That was a great thing that he did for them. And even greater than that was when the the army of Pharaoh and his chariots followed in after that, that God allowed those waters of the Red Sea to come back into their place and drowned and wiped out the entire powerful army of Egypt so that the people of Israel didn't have to ever worry about them again. They were free of that slavery once and for all. That was such a great event in the lives of the people of Israel that it became their identifying feature, that they were the redeemed people of God. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God bases their keeping of the third commandment on that great event in their life. 
And they celebrated the Passover annually, year after year, to mark that great event that God had redeemed them. But today, the Lord comes to his people and says, forget the former things. Don't remember them anymore. Well, why would he say that? Because he says he's going to do a new thing. A new thing. And this new thing is greater than the old thing. It's not that God didn't want them to think about the Passover anymore or not do it anymore. It wasn't that God didn't want them to remember that he delivered them from Egypt. But in comparison to what he was about to do, the new thing that he was going to do for his people, that paled, meant nothing anymore. So what is that new thing that God is going to do for his people, Israel? Well, you have to remember here that Isaiah, in his prophecy is continually prophesying to the people of Israel that they are going to go into captivity in Babylon because they had turned away from the Lord again and again and again in their lives. And that meant that this great nation to the east, this Babylonian empire that they were hearing about, was going to come over to Jerusalem. It was going to knock down the walls of Jerusalem. It was going to destroy their temple. That meant no more worship. It meant that they would be carried off into Babylon. It meant that they would be in despair and captivity for years. But then the Lord says, and then I'm going to do a new thing. And that new thing was that he was going to deliver his people from those Babylonians. From this immense nation. Nobody could even imagine that Babylon was ever going to fall. It was such a tremendous nation and powerful nation. And yet God said, he was going to deliver his people from Babylon. And he pictures that in our text by talking about how he's going to lead them back through the wilderness and provide water for them in that redemption of the people from Babylon, bringing them back home again. In fact, he says even the wild animals in the desert are going to celebrate and rejoice because of the water that I'm going to provide for you in the wilderness. That's the new thing that he was going to do for them. The new thing was he was going to do a greater deliverance, an even greater redemption of the people of Israel to bring them back and make them his people again. The question is, why would God do that? God says he was going to give water to his chosen people. And then he says, I formed you to be my people. I made you to be my people so that you might praise me. What follows in Isaiah is really telling us that what God did, this new thing that God did for them, was all about his undeserved love. He did this new thing because of his grace towards them. Now in our text today, there, the verse 22 is an interesting verse because how you translate that verse makes a difference on how you understand what comes after it. And there's two different ways that this could be translated. The NIV takes one direction. It says, Yet you have not called on me, Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, Israel. The idea behind that the way the NIV translates it is that Israel was looking at all of these wonderful things that God had done and yet they didn't call upon God when they needed him. They didn't weary themselves for God in doing all of the sacrifices and things that he, should be, that he had required of them. And that becomes uh, evident in what follows when the, the NIV translates, you did not do these sacrifices, you did not bring the offerings, you didn't spend your money to buy the calamus to make the things that you were going to offer to me. That's one way of understanding it, but the problem with that is that in the uh, prophecy of Isaiah, it told, tells us very clearly that the people were bringing sacrifices. In fact, they were bringing so many sacrifices, the Lord finally said, I don't want your sacrifices because you're not bringing them with your heart. You're bringing them outwardly, but not inwardly. And so some others have offered a different suggestion, and I tend to agree with the other suggestion on how to translate this, and therefore how to understand this section. And that is to say, instead of saying, you called on me, upon me, Jacob, it would be translated, you called me, Jacob, so that you wearied yourselves for me. And the, or you did not call me, I should say. 
The, the translation then, the difference is that the word call is sometimes used in the Bible as a word to mean choose. And so understanding it that way, what this verse would be saying is, Jacob did not choose the Lord so that he wearied himself for the Lord. In other words, God chose them. They didn't choose him. And as you go on then, the rest of that talking about those sacrifices, saying, and you didn't bring sacrifices to me and you didn't do this and that, that's because when God chose them, there weren't sacrifices yet. He chose them when Abraham was chosen. He chose them when Jacob and Isaac were chosen. He chose them in Egypt before the new covenant or the covenant at Mount Sinai had been established and they were supposed to bring sacrifices. In other God, words, God was saying to them, I'm not choosing you because you've been faithful in doing these sacrifices for me. I'm not choosing you because you have followed my laws and done what I asked you to do. I chose you before you did any of those things. I never burdened you with things to do before I chose you. Those things I gave you to do were ways of your showing thanks to me, not a way of earning my goodness to you. In fact, at the very end of our lesson that we read then, we hear that the Lord said, what you really did is you wearied me, you burdened me with your sins. See, they didn't weary themselves with doing God's word, doing God's will. They wearied him by doing sins again and again and again. And how we see that in the life history of Israel. From the time they were released from Egypt, on, they continued to weary God with their sins in the wilderness again and again and again. But then comes that verse that I read for you at the end. It oozes with God's undeserved love when God says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. So why did God choose this people? Why did he form them to be his people? He says, for my own sake. Because of who I am. And the Lord had revealed who he was to his people. He said, I am the Lord, the gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and forgiveness. Why had God done this? Because he's that kind of God. He's a God of un deserved love. And what did his undeserved love cause him to do with this people who wearied him with their sins again and again? He says, I'm the one who blots out your transgressions. Literally, the word means to obliterate. He simply wipes them clean off the slate. And he says, and I remember your sins no more. God never calls our sins back up once he's obliterated them from us. He doesn't remember them later and say, oh, I remember that sin and now you're going to get that. <clears throat> Instead, he gives us what we don't deserve. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. And that's what he was telling Israel. I'm the one who obliterates your sins, who forgives you. And that's why I gave you those sacrifices. So that in joyful love and thanks to me who obliterated your sins and chose you to be my own people, you could go and serve me. Not because of what you did, but because I have done a new thing for you. So what's that got to do with us? It's got everything to do with us, dear friends. Because this new thing that God did for them was a precursor to another new thing that God was going to do for his people his people of all time and of all ages, including us. Because God was going to do a new thing that was unbelievable, not just okay, but greater than anything possible. And that new thing was when God ransomed us from hell, from sin, from death, and from the devil's power. If you've watched the news recently, you've probably recognized the name Kimberly Sue Endicott. She's that American businesswoman who was in Uganda that was taken captive along with a tour guide by four gunmen, and they haven't found her yet, at least not that I've heard. And they're demanding those gunmen are a $500,000 ransom for her, right? 
Well, if somebody finally did come up and pay that $500,000 and she was let free, how do you think she'd feel? She'd be pretty happy. Do you think she'd be pretty grateful? Do you think she'd probably say thank you to the people, maybe even give them a hug, maybe try to do something for them to show her gratitude and appreciation? See, friends, we were enslaved. We were captured by sin and death and hell. And the ransom price that was demanded for us was not $500,000. It was our life. It was eternal death that had to be paid for us. And God did something that was not just okay. He did something brand new that was unbelievable because God offered his son, his perfect son, whose innocent blood was worth more than $500,000. And his innocent blood shed for us, paid the ransom price for you and for me. And we are free. What is our reaction? What will we do? See, our response to God having chosen us is to serve him, is to rejoice in him, is to do our thing. Our thing is because of what God has done first, his new thing that he did for us. That's why we do our thing, and our thing is not to earn God's love. Our thing is to show thanks for God's love in our life. And God has said to us that he has blotted out our sins as well. He's obliterated them. He's freed us, and he doesn't remember our sins anymore, and so we can do this without fear of ever having our sins come back on us again. Scripture says that he's chosen us. We are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people who belong to God so that we might declare his praise, the one who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's our thing. Our thing isn't earning heaven. Our thing is praising the God who's already won heaven for us. Do you get tired of doing that? Do you weary of praising God in your life? Do you weary of coming to hear his word sometimes? Do you weary of loving others as yourself? Do you grow weary of the crosses that God places on you in your life? We tend to get weary just as the people of Israel did. That, that's our old thing and we tend to go back to the old thing. And that's being weary of God again. And so we weary God with our sins again and again. And there's a warning that the Apostle Paul gives us in Romans this morning about when we do that because finally the people of Israel wearied God to the point where they no longer repented for the sins that they wearied him with. And God cut them off. And then God did another new thing because he grafted in the Gentiles a people that were not his people that he hadn't chosen. But now he chose them too and grafted them into the tree whose root is Jesus. But Paul warns us, be careful that you don't become weary, that you don't take for granted that grace of God because you could be cut off too. And so this season of Lent is a time for us to humble ourselves, friends, to humble ourselves before God and confess the weariness that we have done in our sins against God. But know, but know as you humble yourself that God is the God who blots out your transgressions, who obliterates them. God is the God who forgets your sins and not because of what you do, but for his own sake, for Jesus' sake. You see, that's God's thing. God's thing is forgiving. God's thing is having mercy again and again on us. Just okay is not okay. That's, that's true with God too. Just okay doesn't get you to heaven. You have to be perfect to get to heaven. And that's why God did something that was far better than okay. He sent his son and his son made us more than okay. He, his son made us perfect. Perfect in his sight forever. So that we knowing God's thing more and more, which is forgiveness, we can do our thing then more and more. And our thing 
is giving thanks. Our thing is remembering that God didn't do his thing because of us. He did it because of his grace, his undeserved love. And our God isn't just okay. Our God is great. Our God is the true God. He's the only God. And his thing is forgiving and forgetting. Amen.